Shane Wan trying to get that fourth wicket. Yeah, yeah. And he's gone! It's the 3rd of May, 1995, and Australia are celebrating a series win over the West Indies in time-honoured fashion. Victory has been achieved by a team boasting two players whose prodigious talents lie at the heart of Australia's cricketing success. The defiant leadership and unshakable will to win of batsman Steve Waugh. And the genius of bowler Shane Waugh. First ball for the past two decades. A country of just over 20 million people has dominated the empire of cricket. But how? Pure dominance by the whole Australian team. This is the story of the way Australia turned the sport of their privileged English colonisers into a game for all. The important difference between this country and England is that the idea of class distinction is something that we've, we've prided ourselves on, on not having. From the outback to the suburbs, Australians would play cricket their way. We have a crack and we have a red-hot dip, we play it hard. That's how we're brought up, we play to win, but we're also the first to have great mates off the field. Cricket would provide a common bond, as a young nation united behind heroes like Don Bradman. I saw him play in the first match I ever went to at the SCG, and Bradman suddenly became my hero because he got three centuries in the remaining three games. Australian cricket is intertwined with the country's emergence from Britain's shadow, as a nation in its own right, and as a mighty adversary in the ashes. We love our sport, and we love the cricket team. You know, and for an Australian, since the age of about five, it's been belted into me that you can't let the Poms win anything. The same qualities that raised a nation from the heat and dust helped build a cricket team that would dominate the world. Determination, defiance, the desire to win and an unquenchable fighting spirit. When we walked out on the park, we looked like 11 prize fighters entering the ring. And that's what I wanted us to be. He's done in between his legs. Lally. Come on, boy. And there's Richie Benner looking as happy as any man has a right to be. Bradman has scored his century before lunch. Australia, a country with a reputation for scorching heat. 36 degrees when we were out there just before play began, up to 38 now. It's a nice place to play cricket, if you like the game hot, hard and fast. The climate out here is very conducive to outdoor lifestyle in general, and then in a cricketing sense it's, it's fantastic. Such a rare occasion that rain would affect a game of cricket, and then hence the outfields fast and dry and, uh, and wickets, you know, hard, really firm. In a harsh climate where grass pitches were often a luxury, generations of children turned rugged playing conditions to their advantage. In Australia, we all played on uh, concrete pitches or concrete with matting on, but that was uh, all you had you, if you were at uh, primary school and um, just playing in ordinary fashion, you certainly didn't play on turf pitches. It was good practice to have been on uh, concrete because there was plenty of bounce in that. The better cricketers like bounce in a pitch. It's good for batsmen, but it's also obviously good for fast bowlers, but it's also good for spinners. You know, a spinner who can get a bit of bounce, he's, he's happy. It's the perfect sort of upbringing to go on and play a high level of cricket. Australians have been playing cricket since the country was established as a British penal colony at the beginning of the 19th century. By challenging the forces of the Crown at cricket, Australia's new settlers were taking their first steps towards nationhood. 
In the 1830s and 40s in Sydney, uh, you have the uh, garrisons that were stationed here forming themselves into cricket teams and playing against the local cricket clubs. And one of the reasons why cricket has been so successful is that it has managed to serve both the purpose of paying imperial homage and exercising Australian nationalism, being an outlet for, uh, for our own desire to run our own affairs. In 1901, the Active Federation transformed five British colonies into one new nation, Australia. At the same time, the foundations of the domestic game were being laid, with the beginning of the grade cricket competition. It offers talented players the chance to rise up through the ranks on merit alone, unlike in the mother country. We've never had anything here as there was in England where professionals and amateurs played out of separate change rooms and I imagine that was a, 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 um, a stultifying influence on, on, on cricket in England whereas here if you're good enough you'll get there and I think that has been a fundamental strength of the game here. The best player of them all would emerge from grade cricket in 1927. A batsman from the small town of Barrel, New South Wales, Don Bradman. And now let us see the Prince of Batsmen in action. Don Bradman, just come to man's estate and already known as the most phenomenal run-getting machine the world has ever seen. Born in 1908, Bradman grew up in a country scarred by the massacre of its troops at Gallipoli in the First World War and struggling to cope with the Great Depression. The 30s were the Depression years, which were tough going for people, and you were looking for some role model, and he became that as a, uh, as a, as a cricketer, and he represented Australia, he represented the country, really. As a child, Bradman honed his cricketing skills by using a stump to hit a golf ball against a water tank. With incessant practice, Bradman turned a natural gift into complete mastery of the art of batting. But that's Bradman to reckon with. And Don goes all out to put runs on the board. He puts 50 to his own neck. The thing that amazed me about him was the, his quickness of his eye, the, his perfect position of his feet, and the ability to pick up the line and the length of the ball quicker than anybody else. He wasn't afraid to cross the line, square cuts, pull shots, hook shots. He was just a freak, that's all he was, just a freak. Well, his approach was tremendous, great concentration, had all the strokes, got the runs very quickly. Whether he got 100, 200 or 300, he got them very quickly. Bradman has scored his century before lunch. Don Bradman, the possessor of more records than a gramophone company. Bradman's record-breaking scoring feats in the domestic game caused a sensation in Australia. But it was against England that his legend would be born. In the 1930 Ashes series, Bradman dominated England's bowlers, scoring 974 runs. That's his 200. Well done. The scoreboard reads remarkable at the end of the first day. 458 is the total, out of which Bradman has made 309 not out. It's a world's record. When he started to play his matches again in Australia, you got into a situation where people would flock to the grounds when they knew he was going to bat. And if he got out, they'd go. Bradman's heroics made him a highly marketable commodity. His image used to sell everything, from biscuits to sports equipment. But in person, he came across as the Australian everyman. Even though he was the most famous man in Australia and easily the most, one of the most famous sportsmen in the world, in Australia he lived a very ordinary life. You know, he sold sporting goods, he, he sold shares, he married his childhood sweetheart, he raised two children in the only house that, that he ever bought. This is a country that exalts